Hello, and welcome to our debut show of Photons to Photos. My name is Jeff Ball. This is my YouTube channel, and thanks so much for joining us. Whether you're live or watching this taped, I want to encourage you to be a part of the show. That's what this is all oriented around, is I have some other YouTubers I really admire, and their format is something I think will really uh, afford itself very friendly to the astronomy world. So I'm hoping, hoping to bring something unique and different to astronomy, and it's really driven by the viewer. So let me show you what we've kind of got in mind, what uh, some of the things that we've been thinking about doing here and experimenting with some things, working through some technology. And first and foremost is the format, looking to do a weekly show if we can. Now, having said that, dark, clear skies always take precedent. So we may miss a uh, dark, we may miss a show due to a uh, dark, clear sky uh, on a Wednesday night. We almost had that tonight, but we're going to get into that in one of our topics. So it's going to be a topic question driven show. Tonight we have five topics we're going to review, and uh, one is uh, viewer driven. And I hope that that really morphs into a computer driven environment. So, how do you? submit a question, a topic, well, you can go to my website, earthandskyphoto.com, and you can click on the stream elements link for tips and questions, and that takes you to this website, the stream elements website. I will have that listed on uh, my lower third here throughout the show. And this is uh, how you can submit a question or a topic for a future show. So I ask for you to check that out at Stream Elements. And it's Jeff Ball Astrophotography slash tip at Stream Elements. So that's how you can submit a question. And before the show, I was working with um, my guest for this evening and we had a couple of technical issues and it turns out it's I broadcast on an iMac is really controlling everything I mirror the show onto an iPad I've got my Canon RA as the active camera right now I use the FaceTime camera on the iMac and I'm monitoring on another Windows computer over here the the actual stream health itself but Brent Maynard, my good friend and companion in astrophotography, you may know Brent because he joined me on the modification of a Canon DSLR video that we did a few, man, few months back. And if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to check it out. If you are an astro imager or you're someone who maybe owns a Canon camera and have thought about modifying that camera or having it modified, so we go over some of the uh, challenges and issues around modifying a camera. Brent has modified, I believe, six, seven, eight, maybe up to ten uh, cameras by now. So that was what we wanted to do tonight, but we just could not get the audio to come in from Brent. So this, this was, was what the screen was going to look like, and there's Brent. <laughs> I don't know if he's listening live, but uh, I think he's going to hang in there with us a little bit. He might be hearing it delayed, but uh, we just could not get the audio. So I'm hoping to have Brent on a future show. And But that's his email if you want to reach out. Hey, Brent, thank you for your patience and helping us so much. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and start with the show. And... The first topic we have comes to us from Mike Lockwood. And Mike was responding to a recent video I posted where the Canon, I'm sorry, the ZWO ASI Air just added um, support for the Canon RA. And so Mike, uh, knowing that I deal with the 
use the ZWOASI Air as my primary platform for managing the imaging, posted this question. So it's a technical settings question for the ASI Air Pro. Number one, what mount would you select in telescope setting for the GEM45? That's the Ioptron GEM45, I believe. Can you synchronize the preview image, the focus image, and video mode to all look the same? And he went on to explain it. When using focus mode to focus only, then go to preview mode, the downloaded image is not the same as focus mode image. Are there settings I'm missing other than the pop-out menu in the video mode for gain, blue, green, uh, red, I'm sorry. So Mike, let me, what I did, I did a little bit of research, went, set up my ASI Air with my Ioptron CEM40, and also the, uh, I have it fixed on the Astrophysics 92 millimeter, and I put together a video that I hope addresses some of your questions. So I'm gonna play that video right now. Hey Mike, thanks so much for the uh, question. I'm gonna try my best to help you here. And it looks like you're probably not alone if you're experiencing some frustrations with connectivity issues with the Ioptron GEM45 and the ASI Air Pro. So I did a little bit of research and it looks like Ioptron did a model upgrade around the change of the year, around 20, the end of 2020, the first of 2021, and especially the G models of the mount with the auto guider. But I believe it's also applicable to all new mounts. And it looks like there's, according to ZWO and some of the posts I was reading on the blogs, ZWO was responding that there is a chip compatibility issue with the Ioptron uh, control board with the ASI Air Pro software. So I'm not exactly sure how that goes about being resolved, but they gave some recommendations to either connect the mount via to your ASI Air through a USB hub. And you can either use a USB hub that may be on your ZWO camera or a separate individual USB hub, and it doesn't look like it has to be a powered USB hub. Now, as far as which profile to select, of course, you can experiment with this once you have the right cabling selected with, through a USB hub. I'm guessing if you have a newer GEM45, you're going to have to pick the, the uh, GEM45 CEM40+. Plus. I, in my case, I have an older CEM40, and I go with the old profile. So two things it looks like you need to do is connect your mount. I guess you're down to just one USB port in these newer GEM 45s. Connect your mount via a USB hub, whether that is a hub through your ZWO camera or a separate individual non-powered USB hub. Then connect that to your ASI Air Pro. That seems like the right cabling to go with. And then for a profile, it sounds like you have a newer mount. So I would go with this GEM 45HC FW Plus there. And that's, maybe that's for the hand controller, the uh, 210101. So maybe that's January of 21 that they're indicating that if you have a hand controller that model year, that's what you need to go with. So that's what I'm finding on the connectivity of the GEM45. Now back to, to, well, to your second question is kind of synchronizing the views from focus to preview to video. Focus doesn't have a lot of flexibility in, in the views you have. Now this is my neighbor's wall across the street. And when I put it into focus mode, you can see what we're getting into. This is a pretty severe crop of the chip and I'm not exactly sure what ZWO does with the crop here, but it looks like it's coming right out of the center. And I'm not sure that we can provide a whole lot of control on exactly where this goes. The only thing you can do is click on, you can locate the crop box here and then click on the plus to get a zoomed in view of the object to really achieve your fine focus. 
But back to the primary focus, that's a pretty tight crop because if you go out to preview mode, now what I do is I will achieve focus with my, especially with my Rasa because it's an F2 and knowing that this focus application largely concentrates on the center of the chip. So I will achieve focus here, but then I always go back out to the preview mode and work on focus on the sides of the chip. So when you get the preview image, and it may, you can set it to automatic a refresh on the preview if you want, but I just do a double click, and as you can see, if you double click, that's pretty much the focus field of view that you get. So, and then I will move from right edge to left edge just to verify that I'm in focus, uh, especially when I'm using a fast optical system like a Rasa F2. So a double click, that enlarges the field, that mimics the field of view that you get with focus, and it's about as close as you can get. Now when you go to video, I have never really used video in the field, but you caused me to experiment a little bit here with video. You can see here, you can select in the drop down. I'll just go to 1080p, and you have some options here. First off, let's go back to our, get our exposure out here. This uh, little arrow chevron sign here, and I know I have to increase my exposure. And look how tight this crop is when you're at 1080p and bin one. If you go to bin four, and let me decrease that exposure a little bit, and you can see you're at bin four at 1080p, you're probably just a little bit shy of an entire field of view that you would get with, um, with preview. So there's our video, 1080p, bin four, and there's our preview image. You can see we're, we're fairly close. It's definitely a crop, but it's fairly close in terms of uh, magnification factor, zooming in on the chip. Those bricks look pretty similar to that. So right now, my experience is with my ZWO A ASI 294MM Pro, I have a Ben 4 1080p that's pretty close to the field of view I get with just my normal preview at bin 2. Hey guys, sorry I didn't have that aspect ratio really dialed in on the broadcast, but I think most of the points were, were made on how similar you could get that bin 4 at the 1080p to the preview image. So I think video-wise, that's the closest, at least with the 294mm Pro. I'm not sure if Mike was having any issues with the connectivity through the cabling, but it was really eye-opening when I did a little bit of research on that. I, since my model of CEM40 is over a year old, I didn't realize the changes they had made. I guess there's a reduction down to just one USB port. And even in both the guider mount, the G mounts, and the newer mounts, and that it brought about an incompatibility issue with the uh, ZWO ASI Air Pro, which kind of brings, what when I, if I was going to have Brent here, I wanted to get into a little bit of a discussion about if you're an, a mount manufacturer. Now, I know there are some mount manufacturers who are going to go on their own. They are never going to be reliant on a second party for software to make their mount the most productive and efficient and effective tool possible. Astrophysics comes to mind, uh, software BISC. I'm not sure about Lowe's Mandy. I mean, Lowe's Mandy's kind of in their own game, but here's the model that I think if I was an Ioptron or a Lowe's Mandy is more like an auto manufacturer model, looking at the technology side of the inter interface with the, the driver and embracing Google Play and, and Apple CarPlay and not put all the resources to develop your own IT system in your own vehicle. 
I would think if I was Ioptron, I would do hard testing of every mount to look for compatibility with CWO ASI Air. Again, I understand that there's the risk of relying on a second party to be a critical component to your functionality. But they could probably put off upgrades to their hand controller software, which is already you know, probably locked in, no major changes needed. And with very little effort, just make sure as part of their final quality inspection that they verify compatibility with the ASI Air system. And I, I again, I know it's a dance with the devil, possibly, scenario. Uh, who knows? We know in astronomy that manufacturers and producers uh, come and go. They, uh, they don't always stay around. Matter of fact, I was uh, at a star event and a younger astrophotographer came up and I asked him if he even knew what or who software BISC was. And he had no clue. And he was a very committed imager. So it just goes to show you how the industry can change. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, software BISC was the player across all formats. Now they're a very high-end player, a remote observing. I know they've kind of changed their business model but uh, just goes to show how quickly things can change. So let's, uh, I'm not seeing anything in the chat on that follow-up. I hope, Mike, that helps answer a little bit of your questions. Thank you for letting me experiment with that video capture mode. Uh, I'm hoping to maybe utilize that somewhere down the road. I know my equipment is deep sky oriented, so I'm not, sure how well it could function for a planetary imaging instrument but i'd like to play around with that sometime so let's go on to topic two and of course topic two we had late breaking news where jeopardy announced that mayim bialik and mike richards are splitting host duties for jeopardy so let's talk about how that impacts astronomy no i'm just kidding um but I do watch Jeopardy every night, and uh, Mike, oh, I'm, I'm, oh, I can't remember the champion's name, 14, 15 day champ, over $400,000, it's doing well. Let's go to topic two. Topic two, look, it's been, I know, very tragic out west with these fires, and it's, somewhat trivial for me to sit here and talk about the impact that it has on our astro imaging, but it is a fact. So uh, our thoughts and empathies go out to all of those out west for those tragic fires. But if you are here in the eastern U.S., we wanted to talk a little bit about how they that smoke is impacting our world and what i have up here is today's map matter of fact this is brand new fresh a fresh refresh and as you can see here of course here are the fires plotted in the northern california oregon uh, in the idaho area and it's just tragic the number of acres and human lives being impacted here. Actually, I've been monitoring this for several weeks, this map, and this is probably the most optimistic I've seen it because I've seen this layer of smoke actually start to develop a little notch here that looks like we might be seeing this pull out. But the other, about four days ago, this layer of smoke here was not impacting the Carolinas, Georgia, any of Florida. And so you can see now how that's even impacting there. So we have had some clear skies. And if you go out, you look up and it's just milk. There's nothing crystal clear, transparent blue about it. What actually we are seeing is... Uh, 
on the clear sky clock, he's always optimistic and will start out two or three days ahead of time and the transparency start to look halfway decent. And then that's the way today was looking. And then as we get closer and closer to night, uh, he changes that transparency. And he has uh, uh, the warning about the impact of smoke on transparency. So what I thought I would do is just have a little bit of a conversation around what I've been doing. And, of course, I have started narrow band imaging. And I did do these probably two weeks ago. I believe this was right around the end of July. And I've been building a narrow band on the Seder uh, butterfly nebula area. So this is the hydrogen alpha just with a mild stretch. This is the S2 with a mild stretch, probably about two and a half, three hours. And this is the O3 with, again, a very similar mild stretch. So this is the H alpha just fully processed and stretched and developed. And as you can see, it, it comes out pretty well. So I think narrow band imaging, if you have that in your arsenal, I know Brent had done some work with in this region with a wide field with the STC dual band, dual narrow band filter and had some very nice results. So this might be an opportunity for you to from your backyard to break out any nebula filter that you have, especially if it gets into a, a real tight, narrow wavelength, that might be very helpful here to cut through the smoke. But hopefully the smoke is starting to uh, move its way out. I bike ride, and the other day I joined some riders, and one of my friends told me that he had an acquaintance that had um, solar uh, production on his house. And he told me that the production had been reduced by 15% on comparable sunny days. And so that might be an indicator. I don't know if solar production is 100% applicable to transparency reduction. But uh, that's what had, uh, that's the data that was shared with me about the solar power consumption. So our prayers are with those out west, hoping that they get a relief here in the fire situation. And that uh, obviously that'll bring us some um, smoke relief as well. So let's go on to topic number three. And if you get the digital version of Sky and Telescope from October 2021, they had a new product introduction that certainly grabbed my eye and others in the ZWO group. The ASI Air Plus, I'm sorry, I put Pro in this slide, but I believe it's just the ASI Air Plus will soon be available. Checked out. And we're going to check out the product timeline on um, ZWO. So let's go back to our browser. And here's the Sky and Telescope announcement. And of course, the first thing that jumps out at you is the antenna. If you are a user, and I have used each iteration of the ASI Air. The original ASI Air was fantastic. It was really a life changer for me. If you've watched my videos, you know I really don't want to carry a laptop into the field. So this allowed me to use a phone or an iPad to control the scope and the imaging uh, system for the night. And then they came out with the Pro that gave us the nice power options. It gave us the 5G transmission. It um, gave us, a, well, I think you, you have a USB port for a, a secondary drive if you want that, I believe on the original. 
but I use that on the uh, Pro as well. But the challenge was this metal case it, that really reduced the, the transmission distance, the Wi-Fi distance from the ASI Air. In my case, I put my system out in the backyard and I can I have to put my iPad up in the kitchen window. It's probably less than 20 feet uh, out to my ASI Air transmission. So I don't see anything in here about what the proposed range improvement is. They just say with greater range and reliability than previous versions offered. So, and I went to the ZWO website and I do not see it. Let me refresh just to make sure that they haven't added it today. Uh, this is August 11th. So I just see the ASI Air Pro. But when I went to the, to the website, I thought it was interesting that they had, and I wish all companies had this, they had a ZWO timeline. And they give you a little bit about the founder and CEO, Sam Wynn, on the 28th of November, 2011. And then you can just scroll down. I think I have this link in the description of the show. So you can scroll down and see the major camera launches that they had on the timeline. I think it's just, it's a nice touch that they give you this background and insight into how they've progressed as a company with the instruments that they provide. The ASI Air was released the 28th of July, 2018. Hard to believe that has been over three years ago. And the ASI Air Pro was released on the 25th of October, 2019. So I like that uh, product timeline. I think that's fantastic. I wish all companies would do that. Uh, and then they have their flagship right now, this 2600mm Pro that uh, was released on the 6th of January, 2021. So I thought that was a nice touch. And uh, hey, Franco, thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Again, if you're joining us late or you're just kind of picking up. And the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put chapter markings on the video so if you watch this after the live recording you can just skip to the topic that you want to really see specifically addressed but if you haven't if you're just joining us and you want for next week's show and you want a question or topic i'm encouraging you to go to my web page earthandskyphoto.com go to stream elements tips or questions link and here's where you can submit a question, a potential topic for the future. This link is also in my Instagram as well as in the YouTube description of this video. So thanks for joining us on episode one. And let me get to topic. What are we on now? Topic number four. And please write in the comments about any of these issues that you may or may not have had. For me, it really has hit in my search for an O3 filter. But of course, with the supply chain issues that we hear about on a daily basis have been exacerbated in many industries, including amateur astronomy. In my case, I also have a conversation with a uh, I ride bikes, so my bike shop owner, it is really unbelievable to hear about how the bike industry has been impacted. In particular, Shimano, which makes you know fishing gear as well as bike gear, has they, they had a facility in Malaysia that I believe was shut down for a month because of a breakout in Malaysia just within the last few weeks. So they are a major component producer for bicycles as well as 
uh, you may know, fishing uh, components. So, and of course, we see what's happening in the automotive industry, just totally crazy. If you have a used car, good luck selling it because now's the time. You are going to make some serious money. But in my case, it was an 03 filter, and I've been searching. And Astro Dons, I just don't know where you can find anything. Here's what drove it for me, and that is. the experience I'm having with the O3 filter. Now I know I'm not unique here, but this is this is the O3 filter. This is the 294 MM Pro on the Astrophysics Traveler. And you can see the the flare that you get around. Of course this is Sater. And these are even magnitude seven stars, I believe here. I uh, checked in Sky Safari. So while you can control these with some processing, and these are using the Botter F2 filters because I got these to use with the Rasa. Now I have to tell you, my personal bias is I don't want to stay in image processing for hours on end. I'm looking for the most efficient way to achieve my artistic vision. So I know we can handle this somewhat with, with processing. I think it does compromise the image to some degree. The S2 is not as bad. I can definitely deal with the S2. This artifacting or this flaring here is not nearly as bad. But the O3 with the Botter F2 on it was really bad with the Rasa. I did not bring up a Rasa example, but in the Rasa, I also get the reflection of the the cables that are coming from the camera that are also uh, shadowy here. So that adds an extra layer of complexity in correcting that flare. So that's why I'm using the Astrophysics 92 millimeter. And this is a, a lightly stretched image. This isn't anywhere near where I want to stretch this eventually, but I need to correct these before a full stretch. So that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for O3 filters. And I've been on Astromart. I made a, an offer to a Cloudy Nights person that was selling an entire filter wheel. But these things are hard to come by. And just write in the comments or share with me any supply chain stories that you have because this is a bizarre time, and I hope we learn from this that we probably need to take back some of our manufacturing as much as we can so we're not as reliant uh, on countries that could have these type of scenarios. And we, it's everything from plants closing, fires in plants, pandemic shutdowns, dock shutdowns, dock management container, cargo container management, you know, it's so complicated. So I don't know if it can ever get simplified again, but uh, it's been frustrating for me. I hope you're able to get uh, all that you want out of your Astro gear uh, heading forward. Hey, Mike. Mike Lockwood's in the house. Thank you for the applause. I Looks like you maybe joined us live. I really appreciate your question. I ask for uh, others to, again, please check out the uh, stream elements link in the description of the video for how to submit a topic or question for next week's show. So let's get to our final topic here. And that's topic number five. Now, I was listening to Fraser Kane, and this wasn't late breaking news. He was just answering a question from one of his viewers. And I did not catch this news when it came out. But it was, a, it was about the origination of zodiacal light. Now, I have to say, I have never captured this photographically. I've seen it a few times, especially up at Spruce Knob. And 
but I never photographed it that I'm aware of. I don't, I, I, maybe on the film days I tried it, but I have never captured this. And if you missed it, I put the link to this story in the show notes description. But it's an amazing finding that, again, this was originally released back on March 9th, 2021. But Fraser Cain brought this to my attention. So you know the zodiacal light, the Geigenschein? And when Juno was on its way to Jupiter, and of course it took a circuitous route launching in 2011, they were finding the, the spacecraft being impacted. What I'd like to do is show you this video. It describes it much more elegantly than I could. I hope you were able to see that or hear the video. I wasn't sure any video, any audio was coming through, so I apologize if it wasn't. But it's an amazing story and to I know some of us are photographing the zodiacal light, but, you know, originally I was told it was just the dusty disk remnants of the original formation of the solar system. But now scientists are saying this is particles dust from Mars, dust storms on Mars that have somehow left the atmosphere. They talk about here some of the things they really need to, to uncover is how is, are these dust particles escaping the Martian gravity? So that's one of the questions they need to pose. But just an amazing story. And now we need to explain that zodiacal light uh, maybe a little differently than we have in the past as light that has, or light that is being reflected off of Martian dust. And I think that's just amazing. Okay, I see there. I guess I got some things showing up here on the... Um, thank you for bearing with me. I want to make sure I'm not missing anything over there at the stream elements. And uh, it looks like it might be showing the chat that's coming through YouTube as well. So I'm just trying to get familiar with some of these logistics. So thank you for bearing with me. And I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything, but uh, this is uh, amazing. I know I've got to change the way I describe the zodiacal light as Martian dust particles being reflected at those 
times a year when we have the 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 solar disk, uh, the plane of the solar system uh, at the right position in the sky to be illuminated by the sun. So I thought that was just a fantastic, fantastic insight and discovery by Juno that I had not heard about. And I hope that uh, you're finding that as well. Hopefully, Tim, there's audio coming now. I apologize about the audio on the video playback, uh, but thank you for pointing that out. Hey, Franco, Franco's saying, I'm saving some money for my first real telescope, still searching, but how good is the Mead Star Navigator NG 130 millimeter? It's in my price range. Franco, I'm not familiar with that one. Is that a refractor that I'm guessing the NG is maybe the way they're treating those lens elements? Uh, or maybe that's a reflector. I'll have to do a little bit of research on that scope. And of course, I have a go-to recommendation on first scope. Now you save for money for first real telescope. I got to tell you right off the, the bat, if you got a minute here, share with me, uh, give me just a second. What I will do is give you my base recommendation on a first telescope, especially I don't recommend that you start out with imaging. If you're, I have an entirely different set of recommendations for uh, an imaging setup but if you're a first telescope i'm going to just quickly select this i think this is probably fine but this is exactly where i would recommend this is an eight inch dobsonian it comes with accessories and eyepieces at high point scientific it's the uh, apertura apertura Dobsonian. This is what I have. I've got the Orion version, but this one's fine too. But I just recommend an 8 inch Dobsonian. This thing will do everything you need to do to uh, get into astronomy. And then that'll serve as the base. And you can jump from there. I can't go into all of the things this does. It's a stable platform. It'll have the eyepieces that you need. You can do planetary. You can do deep space. You'll have to learn the sky a little bit. It comes with a finder scope. But this is where I recommend to go, Franco, uh, for a first scope. And it has the aperture that you need, the where you could just truly enjoy some deep sky objects, some of the fainter galaxies. So this is my recommendation. I will do a little bit of research on that Mead Star Navigator uh, at 130. So that's a five inch aperture, basically. And to be quite honest, it, for visual use, that starts to get somewhat limiting as far as being able to really explore. Oops. dimmer objects. Hello. I don't know if you can hear me. All of a sudden I lost audio. It looks like Zoom. Zoom totally compromised my audio here. So let me try to catch back up with you here. Thanks for being patient. I'm assuming my audio is still coming through, but my system here has kind of failed me a little bit. But that is the end of our topic number five. Again, if you are wanting to get a topic or a suggestion in for next week, I encourage you to go over to my webpage, earthandskyphoto.com, tips, questions, and topic links. This link is also in the description of today's show and also on my Instagram page. So check us out on Instagram. This is another link to 
all of my pages. You can send me an email. You can support through Patreon. You can check out the YouTube channel. You can go to the Astro Bin page, or you can check out the uh, Instagram page. Thanks, Mike. Audio is low. Yeah, I don't know what happened here. Something clicked off, um, and I've lost some power to my microphone monitor. But I'm still seeing output going out, and I'm assuming you're getting something there. So, But that's really the end of the show. I wanted to thank you all for joining me for the first episode one of uh, Photons to Photos. And thanks for your participation. It was great having everybody in the chat room. If you got an idea for next week's show, I gave you the resources to check out for that. And uh, until, uh, until next week, I wish you clear skies and uh, you all take care. Thanks for joining. We'll see you on episode two.